us because I'm going to be embarrassed if I see myself on TV. But, um, the fact is, folks, I, I realise there's been so many um, auspicious talkers here before me, so I am humbled to be invited here. So thank you very much. And I'm talking about a topic which perhaps some of Phil has been done to death. Um, in talking about Europe, you mentioned about Europe and the battlefields there. I mean, without doubt in the world, that's where the real war was. Um, in 1915, we were gifted amateurs. By 1918, we were a much different army. But I'm just going to uh, attack this from a different perspective. Um, uh, how long have we got, by the way, Shams? An hour? Five minutes. Is it like <laughs> <laughs> it was seven minutes at the neck. <laughs> Just synchronise your watches. Um, look, James, I come from a curator, curatorial background. Um, apart from being a collector my entire life, uh, and, and I, I'm a, you guys saw the golden era of collecting bits and pieces. Uh, anyone younger than me, I'm 53, uh, now it's an eBay era and uh, you don't get any bargains anymore. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, uh, when you guys were young, uh, stuff was around. Uh, it's just not around anymore. Which brings me to what I'm going to talk about here. I'm going to keep this pretty informal now. I didn't know what to expect numbers wise, but um, having said that, there is two frames of mind, two trains of thought as to whether items should be removed from a battlefield or not. Uh, you could ask Jay, um, Charles Bean the same question from 1919 when he went back for the mission, uh, and, and I'll give you both of my opinions because I've got a foot in each camp, so to speak. Especially if we have a battlefield guide here, it's great to go to a battlefield and show people relics on the ground. The unfortunate thing is, everyone picks it up these days. Anyway, we'll, we'll cover that. So, folks, um, my talk is military from the Gallipoli campaign. Now, now, militaria and battlefield refuse is really tied up with the human side of war. Uh, being the creatures that we are, folks, uh, we, we throw things away, we drop things in the heat of battle. Um, you know, essentially, we tend to lose things. So, so when we go back 70, 80, 90, 100 years later, um, it's the trained eye, I guess, which picks these things up. And we start to try and build a jigsaw puzzle as to what life was like in that particular era, at that particular time. So again, I hope you enjoy this talk. Please um, engage or jump in and tell, uh, ask any questions as we go along. I'm not one of these ones that says we have to wait to the end for questions. Um, I'll, I'll try my best to answer them for you. But okay, so we all realized 1914, you guys are all uh, very experienced historians. We answered the call. Uh, Norman Lindsay painting shows an Australian there uh, wearing basically British pattern webbing or equipment. Um, so it's that sort of equipment that we look for or traces of that equipment when we go back to the battlefield. And as, as um, Shaber said, uh, I, I was very lucky to go around Australia with, uh, with a well-known Brit black, from Blackadder, who knows Baldrick. Yeah. <laughs> and I did the an antiques roadshow type thing where people would come and bring things in. It really it was, was great fun. Uh, it was a really, really good bit of time. But yeah, when you just look at a poster like this, Norman Lindsay is the artist. You've all seen this poster before, perhaps. But yeah, you just know he's wearing O3 pattern, he's wearing a bandolier, uh, what people would call a light horse bandolier. It's not technically correct, it's O3 pattern. But the belt he's wearing is the snake and the clasp. Mm. Okay, yeah, the old snake, it used to fit into a hook. Yeah, so that was common. Every man his dog wore it, uh, Slade Wallace equipment, and uh, I think the Canadians had it in their Oliver equipment uh, during the First World War. So, so what I'm getting at is leather does not survive, but the metal does. Mm. Yeah, so when we go to battlefields, we look for these things. So I'm going to start off with a mystery object. Normally I hand things with gloves. Um, today I'll just go unmasked. So we have a mystery object here. Um, if you know it already, keep it to yourself. And uh, you can nudge the bloke next to you if he doesn't know it and you can boast. But having said that, we will reveal all towards the end. But when we look at this item here, this was recovered on the high ground above Anzac Cove. Yeah, so in a well-protected, lived-in area. Yeah, a non-battle related area. Um, so having said that folks, uh, you can see it's got a, a hinge point in the middle uh, and it's got two what could be handles to our left and I'll leave the rest to your imagination to the end of the tour. Are we still rolling, James? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so when we start to, to look at things, um, again I've been to, to Gallipoli numerous times. Uh, hey, can I have a show of hands? Who's been to Gallipoli before? So pretty much everyone, yeah? So you guys are going to know when I'm lying, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just feel free to go to the toilet and don't come back. So, <laughs> so having said that, folks, um, I first went to Gallipoli in 1988. Uh, 1988, it's going back a fair while, and there was a lot of stuff around. Uh, progressive years, I'd go back again and again, and there'd be less and less and less again. Um, after 1994, uh, virtually the whole place was picked clean. The simple reason being there was a fire. A big bushfire went through Gallipoli, everything was burnt out, um, everything that was on the ground covered by grass or leaf litter, and, and you know, 
pine trees everywhere, Gallipoli to the pine needles covered everything. Everything was exposed, so it's pretty much been picked clean since 1994, which is a real tragedy. Um, when you consider that in 1915, the place was bare and you could wander anywhere you wished, um, due to the fact that Turkish goats would have been going through there for years, eating everything up, um, you, you simply can't walk now through Gallipoli as you could have in 1996, for example, after the fire. Uh, this object here, I, I find little objects like this to be extremely personal. Um, that's the object here. And again, I invite you to come up after the uh, talk and, and feel free to have a look around. Just be very gentle. This stuff is extremely brittle. Uh, you can see it's a New Zealand tunic button. Uh, it would be for either the pockets or little pellets. Um, and this was found in between the apex and the pinnacle. Um, on the climb up towards Chunuk Bear, uh, which is largely a New Zealand area. So again, I find this personal, for the simple reason being, uh, every man had a rifle, to a certain extent. Everyone had equipment and, and webbing, things such as that, but this is a man's personal tunic button, yeah? Um, you can see the New Zealand flag here, and, and look, from this campaign, the only Victoria Cross awarded to New Zealanders was to a man by the name of who? Can you help me out here? Cyril Bassett. Did I hear you say that, Seamus? Well done. <laughs> Cyril Bassett, well done. So he's the only one who won Victoria Cross. So when we start, when I think of New Zealand on, on Gallipoli, two stories come to mind. One is a bit long-winded. I'll tell you about that afterwards if you wish to hear about some Maoris who slaughtered some Turks. But the other one is Cyril Bassett's quotation that after having received the Victoria Cross, his reply was, well, all my mates got were wooden crosses. And, and when you hear um, humble, poignant comments such as that, I got a chill just saying that now. Um, it just really puts things into perspective. Uh, we decorate soldiers, we, we put great names to uh, actions and, and battles, but nonetheless, things are, uh, the human element, it, it, again, is what interests most of us. Yes, that little button there again, uh, I'm an ex cop, did he tell you that? No. Nah. I haven't booked anyone here, and I'm pretty confident of that. I don't yeah? know that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any faces on no posters lately. Um, but having said that, folks, uh, 23 years in the cops, uh, I used to be in a section where you'd go looking for, for evidence. It was called the OSG, or Operational Support Group. Um, so, so I guess my training in, in, um, in looking for minute pieces of evidence in the cops has paid off for what I've done uh, overseas. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit more later on. Um, okay, so this device here has probably captured your attention from the very start. Uh, they say to me when public speaking, never put something on there that's going to take the focus away from you. Yes. Well, put your camera on that thing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, you all know what this is, or, or perhaps you've seen it, you've heard of it, uh, you've seen it in books. Uh, of course, it's called the Beach Periscope Rifle. People think it's B-A-C-H for the beach itself. No, it's not. Uh, William Beach was an Englishman. Uh, who was serving in Australia, obviously, the Second World War, oh, sorry, the Second World War. The First World War breaks out and he enlists into the AIF. Now it's a misconception, or people don't realise how many Brits were serving in the AIF. Who knows that Simpson's a pawn? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. pretty much all do. Mm -hmm. Not many kids do. Yeah, mm -hmm. Simpson is donkey, he's a good old Aussie. Yeah, sure, he breaks, spoke with a, with a heavy accent. But nonetheless, you can see there by his tunic, as is William here, uh, he's wearing the QSA, or Queen South Africa ribbon, and the KSA, King's South Africa weapon, uh, Ribbon. So he had served in the British Army during the Boer War, comes to Australia, uh, he gets a job as a, a, um, uh, a builder's foreman, and during the course of 1915, or 1914 I should say, the war breaks out and he enlists in the 1915. Uh, you can see there he's wearing his 1914-15 star. I'll get onto that, but he was discharged early. Yeah. So, okay, William Beach, what did he do? So if I can use a quotation actually, just bear with me. This is one of those quotations which um, it's not often referred to in any of the books. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, Gallipoli has been very well written about. Some would say written to death, yeah? Mm -hmm. But every now and again, a nice little gem pops up, a nice little bit of information which I've never seen before, perhaps you have never seen it either. Now, this is a quote which takes place uh, fighting on the 19th of May. The 19th of May, for those who have been to Gallipoli, you'll know that was the day of the big Turkish offensive, the attempt push the Anzacs into the ocean. We had our backs to the sea, uh, the Turks were coming, we were dug in on Second Ridge, and uh, had we got pushed off that ridge, it would have been one hell of a slaughter. So, 19th of May, 1915. The sap was between 70 and 80 yards in length, and along it lay several dead Turks. On reaching the head, we found five of our men dead, including Sergeant Higgins and Fred Thompson both of whom were alive when the beach had left to get reinforcements. We saw that they had been shot through the head. 
Thus, a periscope was essential for our very existence. And one was found under the bodies. Beach, William Beach, immediately put it up and was alarmed by what he saw. Taking the periscope from him, I too received a shock at the sight of what I estimated to be four battalions of Turks forming up for another attack. Now this is taking place in a place called Owen's Gully. Again, for those who have been to Gallipoli, it separates Johnston's Jolly from Lone Pine. So it's on the 400 plateau. Yeah. So uh, as you come out of the cemetery, you go down a slight hill and you go around a sharp bend and it's that gully immediately to your right and it runs down to Leggy Valley, which is where the Turks were all massing. Turks were forming up for another attack. Bombs, meaning like jam tins, bombs were as distant as the moon and our only weapons being rifles and bayonets. Had we attempted to aim over the top, we would have exposed our head and shoulders and have immediately followed our dead pals who had been shot through the head from the high ridges flanking the ravine. So that's Turks on Johnson's Jolly to their, sorry, to their left and uh, Heights of Lone Pine to their right. Beach, with tears running down his cheeks, momentarily criticised our awful predicament and remarked, it's hell to see this mass of Turks <coughs> not being able to bomb or snipe at them. With a periscope fixed to a rifle, it would be possible, he said, to fire accurately without personal danger. So this is taking place on the 8th, sorry, correction, the 19th of May. Later that same afternoon, so the attack had started to peter out, a major by the name of Blamey, anyone heard of him? Very obscure, little known man in Australian military history. Major Blamey is doing a uh, inspection of the Australian trenches, of the Australian positions, around near the Pimple, which is to the southern part of Lone Point. And uh, as a result of that, he spies two men from the 2nd Battalion, of course, uh, Beach was A Company, 2nd Battalion. He spies these two men who were uh, clumsily fiddling with a device made from broken boxwood and wire. Yeah. So of course the device looked very similar, if not the same as this, but held together by bits of sig wire. That's a hundred year old sig wire from my house, by the way. <laughs> um, I was going to set up a, uh, a scurry drip rifle, folks, but we just kind of ran out of space and time, so please excuse me on that. But nonetheless, so he's, he's making this device on the afternoon of the same attack, 9th of May, 1915. As a result of that, uh, Blamey uh, had a fair bit of foresight and he um, mentioned the HQ. Beach was taken down to headquarters on the beach. That's the B-A-C-H. Taken down to the headquarters at the beach, uh, showed his device. It was tested up at Lone Pine. So again, they, they fiddled with it, got it down pat, took it up to Lone Pine. And as they were going up, some puzzled onlookers saw them carrying this device. And um, they must have considered it looked like cricket stumps because the, the digger replied to the uh, puzzle, puzzled onlookers uh, that they're going up to play the Turks in cricket. Yeah, so <laughs> two stumps, not three. Uh, anyone named Jake the Pig, by the way? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that's another story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, poor Rolf. So having said that, folks, um, at Quinn's post it was tried. Now this thing was found to be accurate up to 300 yards. Up to 300 yards, yeah? And as a result of that, uh, Beach was relieved from duties, and so by the following day, uh, he was uh, in the processes of setting up a factory on the beach, which is what you can see here. Um, it's a bit hard to see with that footage, but you can see now, instead of broken boxwood and wire, it's proper timber frames, and uh, you can, there's screws. If you, if you have a look at Better Shot this photo uh, from a book, perhaps, you'll see there's screws holding the rifle in and holding the actual frames together. But the fact of the matter is, they denuded all the ships of their mirrors, uh, off Anzac, and uh, it's claimed that they made up to 2,000 of these devices between May and December. That's a lot, yeah, mm -hmm. 2,000. Well, you can just see by this photo here, uh, again, that's William Beach, and you can see there's quite a number here just mm -hmm. lined up as they are. Uh, what I have failed to find out is how, in fact, they secured the rifle to the support, this portion here. I don't know how they did that. But nonetheless, this is an actual working model. I'm a bit of a, um, a Mythbusters road test kind of guy. So we've actually fired this device, uh, which is why I had to reinforce it. Uh, these portions here uh, aren't historically accurate. They're just there for reinforcing. But nonetheless, this is the device, of course, which um, we all agree saved lives without any doubt in the world. Plus, it gave the added bonus of uh, securing superiority of firepower. Now, um, uh, again, for those who've been to Gallipoli, the trenches at Quinns and near the Pimple on um, uh, 400 Plateau were 12 to 15 yards apart. 
12 to 15 yards. That's pretty damn close. That's probably as far as you and I are now. Certainly within bombing distance. Yeah, it's at the back of the room here. Okay, so if he starts to throw something at me, I want you to come in the back now, all right? All right, folks, so having said that, there was an inventions committee, surprisingly. You would think, okay, a guy invents something, oh, sorry, Gaff, okay. could I just ask a question before I forget? Yeah, please. Uh, did the Turks take the idea on? Surprisingly not. Mm. This device, oh, I'm sort of jumping ahead a bit, but this device was actually used to some extent and under a different variation in France, but no. They never did, and just like, uh, well, again, the Scurry Drip Rifle I'll talk about very shortly. Um, no, they didn't, surprising. Um, you know, you think the Germans would have caught onto it? Uh, there were Germans at Gallipoli in very, very small, limited numbers, but nonetheless, no. There's no, no talk of that at all. But uh, look, again, for that, you guys have all read books, there was huge sniping duels. Uh, you've heard of Billy Singh, perhaps, uh, from Light Horse. Mm -hmm. um, there's been many shows, TVs, uh, TV shows and, and books written about snipers, deliberately sniping the like. Um, sniping was certainly um, a, a pastime, very dangerous pastime, and uh, only the best survived, without any doubt in the world. Um, if, if this one isn't a flop, Seamus, put me on the camera here, you might ask me to come back and talk about Billy Singh, yeah? <laughs> okay. okay, but chances are it will be a flop, so. <laughs> yeah, okay, so again, you. what's that, mate? We're already downvoting you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you haven't slipped out of the toilet yet. Yeah. Um, so having said that, guys, um, as I said, he, he evades, or when I say evades, because he's setting up this factory on the beach now, uh, he, he did not fight in the battle for Lone Pine on the uh, 6th of August. 1915. So by that stage here, uh, he was on the beach making devices. He was then sent to Egypt uh, to continue uh, in his works. And um, he came down with acute rheumatism. So he was actually evacuated from Gallipoli uh, well before the campaign ended, I think even October 1915. Uh, so, uh, so he didn't see the, the, the war out. Again, he was an older man of 36 when he enlisted. Yeah, an older man of 36. I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> I miss being 36. Um, okay, folks, so having said that, yeah, as I said, by the 26th of May, these guys have set this, this uh, factory up, and, and these things are in mass production, so there's no doubt in the world. So we did gain superiority of firepower, and, and, and from an infantryman's perspective, um, if you can dominate the battlefield with, with firepower, uh, minimise the, the Turk um, ability to, um, to gather intelligence through sighting or, or spying, then of course you're gaining the upper hand on the battlefield. Yeah, but it got to the stage where snipers were shooting out periscopes. Um, so if you put your little mirror, uh, you know the device where you had a stick with, with two mirrors, um, they were getting shot out. So that's how good the turkey snipers were. And, and ours were equally as good. So uh, having said that folks, um, again I said there was a, a, an invention committee. Uh, when Beach was in Egypt, he was asked what would he like as compensense, or compens, compensation, the compensation for his device. Would he like a grant? And he said, yes, I would like a grant. So when he comes back to Australia, he puts in for a grant. Um, the, the application goes all the way through to Birdwood. Now the war's over by the station, yeah? Goes all the way through the Birdwood. And as a result of that, he was given a hundred pound. Yeah, he was quite a substantial amount of money. Yeah, yeah so he done pretty well. And as a result of that, unfortunately, Beach came back, as I said, he, he left early, left the army early. He died in Condoblin in 1920. You know I mean, so in relative uh, obscurity, which is real sad. Yeah. Again, a man who invented such a device fades away into history. Uh, that's just a, a, a close-up photo from the beach. I, actually, you can see there the screws. Can you see it there now? Yeah. The yeah. problem with this device was the screws, of course, damaged the rifle butt. Hmm. Okay, that's not working. Okay, what happened here? It's my computer, so I can't blame you. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Might, we might as well go back out of it. Okay, it's time for a toilet break. Anyone want to go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, I'll just use this slide here just to show you. If you look at that device, you can see it's identical to this device here where the supporting timber is actually up high on the furniture, Yeah, where, where the forehand grip would be. But if you notice this picture here, this is perhaps the most famous of all the beach periscope photos. You can see here that the angled bit of timber is on the pistol grip. Has anyone noticed that before? No? You've all seen these photos, no doubt. Hi, coming in. No, please do. This is our new guest speaker. Would you like to come up here and help me out? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, again, so when you look at these devices here, you'll know that, that there's two different devices. Now, there's nothing in writing to say why one was over the other. If Beach himself is setting up the devices, I can only suggest that perhaps 
other people of course they were brilliant and they were just just variations uh, there's nothing written written at all uh, to indicate which one was better or which one was preferred but what is written in his service record which is not written in any other service records is that he is credited with being the inventor of the beach periscope how many were produced you know well again the the story goes up to 2000 were, were built up to 2000 now you've got to realize now that that of course we're at Anzac uh, we have the British uh, in August to the north at Suvla, they've always been at helis uh, to the south. So it wasn't just Anzac where we used these devices, they, they were used up and down the line. So without doubt in the world, the Brits, the Brits used them as well, even though there's no photographic evidence to support that. It looks like the soldier's body uh, helps to withstand the backfire, you know, from a 303. That's a 303, isn't it? Indeed, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah, therefore, it's got a sub substantial plunge. Quite a, quite Correct, a yes. Yeah. So, so the rifle is a SMLE, or short, yeah. magazine yeah. Lee Enfield, number one Mark III. So, so, which is exactly this here. Yeah. Short magazine, uh, no one mark three. Now the thing is, we've actually fired this one here. So, so what you're asking is, there's next to no recoil for the actual recoil. Recoil. That's the word. Oh, recoil. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a pivoting motion mm -hmm. about your shoulder, because this is essentially how it's held. Yep. You know, the, I'll stop into the, in the point of the shoulder and pulling on the string here, here's my string. Yeah. Which is actually a three three pull through. Oh, Plating, cleaning no, that, no, that block um, takes the recoil. It, right. it, it, it's actually it's a rotation as opposed to a recoil. There's a rotation, a tendency to pull up, but not by much. It, it's not uncontrollable. So when you hang on to that device, um, incidentally, if anyone wants to come to Batemans Bay SSAA range, I'm more than happy to give you some shots. Yeah, <laughs> really good fun. Yeah, but having said that, yeah, there's no recoil. No recoil for the fire over this device, even though the recoil on the 303 is usually quite quite substantial. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Gary, how do you, um, I know you said earlier that yep. you don't know how it was actually um, attached at the uh, barrel, yeah. yes. but how do you hold it with a grip? Yeah, the same cut? well actually, to secure the firearm for that, as you can see that yeah, yes. uh we put a leather strap. Okay. Uh, which is not historically accurate. There's no photos to support that either. Okay. Judging by that, um, they have actually fully nailed into the timber. Um, <laughs> which, which brings me, there was another device by a chap on that was Tosti, T-O-S-T-E-E, and he was um, 10th Battalion, uh, South Australian from the 10th Battalion. And he invented a similar device on Gallipoli, um, but uh, again, they, they favoured beaches. Uh, Tosti did not receive any recognition for his device at all. Um, and there's one device I'm going to show you very shortly uh, where it's made from a completely different uh, method entirely. But okay. this is the one that prevails in terms of knowledge. Um, so in terms of that, we, we, we put a leather strap here. Um, that is normally drilled through. This is not the rifle, of course, we use for our shoots. Uh, this is actually a dummy rifle. The, the barrel's been removed and there's a timber dowel up the centre where the barrel would normally be. I had my personal armour in here, inspect the firearm, <laughs> and they gave it the approval. Um, so having said that, uh, yeah, there is normally a, a device, you can see by the photos, the previous photos, there was two screws fixing the butt to the frame, if that, if that answers your question, yeah? As I said, it's really good fun to fire, folks. Right? So, um, one thing of note, just look at this uniform here, without a doubt, that is summer. Okay, summer being the August months, which is why we have the summer offensive, the, the 6th of August, 7th of August, 8th, 9th, 10th attacks. Hopefully this will work again, and it doesn't. I'm not sure, folks, why this has suddenly stopped working. Okay. Okay. This also is Gallipoli. So, um, I guess from a, from a curatorial background. It's my job to look in fine detail at certain things. Um, have you noticed these photos before? No doubt some of you guys have been through the AWM photo um, website. Um, this frame here, you can see they're both the same type of frame, is a thick wire construction, a heavy wire. Uh, you can see it has a similar system where it's loaded into the firer's butt. Um, and of course, the string, I'd assume that the trigger is activated by the same thing. Not one of these devices survives. There is also very little to no information about this device at all, other than the fact this is Gallipoli, and it's without a doubt the um, spring months, summer, or autumn, autumn months, I should say. Um, it definitely, and you can tell by the uniforms, okay, that they're, 
it's later in the campaign. If I just refer to a quotation on this one, um, you beg my pardon. Okay, herewith is a type of periscope invented by Corporal G. Seawood. Mm. It has been tried in the trenches and reported as follows. Superior to anything used thus far. So they're saying superior to beaches uh, design and also to Tosti's. Mm. Requires small staples or eyelets on each side of the small of the butt for cable work through. The mirror can so be adjusted to enable the sights to be raised if required. So this one here, uh, as I said, it was accurate up to 300 yards. There wasn't that many targets on Gallipoli in excess of 300 yards. Um, even when the Turks launched that massive attack on the 9th of May, I mean, we're talking from Turkish Quins to Australian Quins, again, 15, 20 yards the maximum. There should be less play in the trigger and it's claimed to have better control over the rifle. Um, the inventions committee put the added bonus was that the mirrors are rigid and that does not damage the butt of the rifle. So all I can suggest is that this device here is clamped somehow in this area here and as a result no screws are required to be put through the timber which from an armourer's perspective I mean an armourer quartermasters are fairly picky any XQMs here any QEs <laughs> no one wants to admit to it there's a guy got a hand up there so uh, again you you uh, start to damage government property someone's going to uh, have a word to you about it <laughs> so has anyone seen this device no, no. no. Um, I, I did a story for wartime uh, of a couple of years ago now. Uh, I think it was 58, issue 58, and, and they actually cut this bit out, which is the bit I really wanted because most people knew that this thing existed but had never seen or paid attention to this, this device here. All right, so bear with me. Okay. Nice plan. Come on, lads. Unload your rifle. Nothing at this boat. We're going into the bench. Open it. Unload. Nothing at this boat. We're going into the bench. Steady, lads. Wait for it. that footage to refer back to the, my original comment in terms of a battle when things such as that happen as you can tell there's confusion there's panic there's a lot of emotion there um, men are slaughtered in their hundreds um, things are dropped things are lost and things are discarded things become rusty pieces of metal on a battlefield somewhere to be discovered 70 80 <coughs> 90, 100 years later um, for those of you who are from Malaysia on here for a two-week holiday hands up so that's the battle of the neck NEK, which took place on the 7th of August 1915. So it's from the film called uh, Gallipoli with uh, Mel Gibson and um, Mark Lee by Peter Weir. So uh, have you seen that film before? <laughs> we have a friend here, I don't mean to single out, but these Malaysian people need to be uh, made a fuss of, I think. So having said that, that's a, <laughs> it's perhaps Australia's best film, I think. That's my humble opinion. But having said that, folks, 
Well, I don't want that again. I really am having trouble with this computer, aren't I? It's just uh, turn the camera off there, huh? Should have brought your wife. Yeah, I, this is my son's computer. <laughs> I think they could have had clean uniforms on. Toilet break number two, folks. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Should have. Be a 14 year old. That's a naked company out in the room. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Whatever, whatever we have to do, probably buy watches. You'll find a 14 year old. Does anyone here know how to drive a computer? I don't know. No, Rob, I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so going back to that footage, as you can see, um, uh, as you can see, um, uh, Four waves of 150 men charged over the top on the 7th of August 1915 and, and their bones lay there till 1919. Yeah, till 1919. So the first two waves, Victorians from the 8th Light Horse, second two waves, um, West Australians from the 10th. And if you go to Gallipoli now, um, I urge you to, to actually go to where the Australian trenches were, or you, there's still some remnant trenches there, but you can see how the land to the left drops away. So when you leave the Australian trenches on the far left, uh, the Turks couldn't see the Australians, or they couldn't see their whole body uh, for a certain distance until they actually advanced forward because the ground slopes away to the left. But the reason why I showed that footage there is, of course, that's the Enfield number one Mark III, the 303 rifle we all know. What we have here is a broken or shattered breech from that same rifle. Now, this was recovered from on the Turkish side of German officers' trench. So uh, for those of you, again, who are familiar, you've got uh, from the south going north, you've got Lone Pine, Johnson's Jolly, yeah, you then have Steele's Post. So this, this is the Turkish position opposite Steele's and from German officers' trench, it was an elevated position. They could have a clear line of sight uh, enfilading Quinn's Post, or Courtney's and Quinn's, yeah? So having said that, uh, this is an Australian rifle part, shattered uh, and lands on the Turkish side. Was it from day one when we got that far? I'm not too sure because we, after day one, by 26, it was in Turkish hands and it remained in Turkish hands up until December, yeah, when we evacuated. Um, I, I would suggest perhaps uh, we did fire mines, um, we tunneled underneath Turkish positions as they did to us and blew each other up. I would suggest this rifle was subject perhaps of a mine explosion or hit by artillery. But again, I invite you to come up a little bit later on and have a bit of a look. But as I said, it's, it's bits and pieces like this which turn up on the battlefield when you when you go looking. Um, just incidentally, it was only that the round portion there, the ball of the bolt, which was showing above the ground. Um, so you can imagine my, my heart went in my mouth. How am I gonna get a four foot long the Enfield rifle back through customs? Uh, I was a tiny bit relieved uh, when it was that short, but having said that, folks. Um, so yeah, having said that, folks, um, these devices now, again, I can only shudder to think what was happening to a man if he was holding onto that at the time. Uh, again, totally and utterly tragic. Um, but for a device to be in that sort of condition, whatever fate it was, it was horrific and catastrophic as he sort of snapped the rifle essentially in half. I'm really going to be happy if this computer works again. All right, there we go. I'm going to go back. Try again. To previous. Seamus, you're going to edit this video, aren't you? Hmm. <laughs> All right, so, right. Um, folks, I've got a, a number of bullets here at the front and bullet casings. Um, just, I've shown a photo here. I mean, bullets still litter the battle group, battlefield if you know what to look for. The top one, of course, is a Australian bullet. The bottom one is a Turkish bullet. I don't, I won't split hairs about rimmed and rimless rounds uh, on this particular lesson here, but um, the top round is actually a Mark Seven. Uh, the Mark VI round, which perhaps most of you are more familiar with, with Gallipoli, is the one with the round head. You can see it's got a pointy projectile. The Mark VI had the round head. And I've found both Mark VI and Mark VII rounds on the battlefield itself, if you're into ammunition. Um, so having said that, of course, the lower round, the Turkish one, um, solid steel core, which is why it's rusted the way it has. But again, I just use that as an example. Again, you can imagine, you saw in that video footage of men going over the top, these things are all lost uh, in times of war. The next slide. There we go. Is something which is probably <coughs> my, one of my favourite pieces, um, if I can. Now, again, we talk about the human aspect of war. Um, anyone know what that is? Can anyone recognise it? I've got it here in my hand, so it's very, very, very small. It's not as big as that. To clasp it. To clasp it. I reckon you've got to know. You, you would 
you're going to kick yourself when you yeah, find no, probably <coughs> So that's the clip. It holds up. Yes. Yes, it is. So this clip here, um, <laughs> again, it's. Uh, I'm not one to to gloat or revel over battlefield refuse like that. But to me, this is personal. Yeah. This was on a man's slouch hat. Uh, it was found on Russell's top, which is the so where the next battle takes place. Follow the ridge down towards the ocean. And that's the whole Russell's top area. Um, it was in our hands pretty much from day one, though the Turks did infiltrate down there quite a fair bit and snipe um, from Russell's top. Um, but again, yeah, to find something like that, and uh, I'll pass that one around if I can. I can just be very gentle with it. You can see it's been squashed, someone's trodden on it. But uh, again, if that clip could tell a story, yeah. Um, again, we all know, do you know what the Snapchat looks like? I'm singling you out now, I'm starting to pick on you. So the Australian slouch hat was like a big floppy hat and they turned the left hand side up, yeah? Very handsome, Seamus will get you one. Mm. Okay, which brings me to the next device. Now folks, you must excuse me. Um, I had grand visions of setting up a working scurry drip rifle. So this man here, he's a boy to the left, 58th uh, Regiment, uh, Geelong Rifles. Um, is William Scurry. He's the man who invents the drip rifle. Yeah, the concept of the water dripping from the tin, goes inside the mess tin, mess tin fills full of water, falls down, pulls a weight and, and sets a rifle off. Again, it was my grand plan to set one up here, folks. I must apologize. Um, but nonetheless, perhaps without a doubt, the most famous of all devices, had a lifespan of about six hours. Yeah, let's talk about that. So William Scurry, uh, young fella. Now there's a few things about William Scurry which I found amazing when we start to break down things. Again, it's fine to look at devices and hardware. Let's look at the human aspect. This boy here, and he, and he was very much a boy. Uh, he was 19 years of age when he enlists. Now in the AIF in the First World War, what was the age limit? When, when did you, how old did you have to be before you did not need mum and dad's permission? Anyone tell me? I don't know. 21. 21. 21. 21. Yeah, 21, well done. So if you were under 21, you had to get your mum or your dad to sign your papers to say, yep, you're off, yeah? Strangely enough, William Scurry, both his mum and his dad signed his papers. It's the only set I've ever seen of War of it. Is that, is that my time up? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> is that the get off signal? Um, so both his mum and dad signed this. Now, William Scurry, uh, he was a pre-war militia cadet, as you can see on the left-hand side there. Uh, he was in the 58th Regiment, uh, Victorian. Uh, and of course, he joins up. Uh, of course, this photo is taken post-war. He starts off as a private, ends up as an officer. Uh, you can see the A on his shoulder. Uh, I was talking to someone beforehand about Montbrehan. Who was that? Montbrehan being the last battle fought by Australians, I'm sorry, Australian infantry on the Western Front. I uh, can't remember. Anyway, if you think of Gallipoli as being our first battle in 1918, um, what was it? of October 1918 we fight the Battle of Montbrehan that that's the battle where Charles Bean is walking along and he sees a dead digger laying laying on the ground and he laments at the fact that the digger has an A a brass A on yeah. his sleeve yeah is everyone here familiar with the brass A that meant that you served on Gallipoli, Gallipoli. the A Original. yeah you served on Gallipoli or were in support of Gallipoli perhaps in Egypt or something too long um, so having said that, yeah, I mean, to be killed in the last battle, 6th of October 1918, just under a month away from uh, the end of the First World War, um, yeah, yeah, Bean actually remarks that the pity or the, the, the tragedy of the fact that this digger has died. Anyway, come on, story short, uh, this fellow here, uh, 90 years of age, joins up. Um, he had been a um, architect's modeler before the war. So his job was to receive a set of plans and to build a little model of the building. And, and when we, we're not far here from uh, Town Hall, um, from Queen Victoria building, they had pride and craftsmanship in the work they were doing back in those days. No offence to this fine building here, or the Seamus' house, but there's not much imagination in that one anymore, is there Seamus? Um, these are real buildings, and, and again, for him, uh, he, he obviously was very good with his hands, and, and he had a very inventive mind, because he could take something from a bit of paper and put it into practicality. So this is William Scurry. Okay, so of course this is his invention. What I failed to produce today, uh, of course. So, so you can see the basic principle is the rifle would be left in situ on sandbags. Uh, there would be a a container full of water here, which would drip down into this container here. When the weight of the water fills this container, it drops and it pulls a rock 
off the small of the butt. And that rock is attached to a string to the trigger. Now this device, for those who aren't familiar with it, was a ruse, it was a, a ploy to make the Turks think that we were still in the trenches <coughs> during the time of the evacuation. The evacuation being the 19th and the 20th of December, 1915. So we're trying to shoot through, we want the Turks to think we're still there, so he came up with this device here. Um, very, very incredible device. Again, it had a lifespan of six hours, roughly. Yeah. After that, it went off into obscurity. Um, having said that, I bought a second prop. If you can just look at this rifle for a sec, or this half rifle, compare it to this one here, you'll notice there's quite a few bits and pieces missing from the lower rifle. Yeah? Nose caps, um, magazines, bits of timber. Uh, this is a fairly old and beat up sort of device, a bit like myself, old and beat up. I don't know if you want to pass this around. This has been rendered safe. <laughs> Feel free to have a look. That's I've got a bit of weight to put in there. So having said that, um, <laughs> late last year, um, out of Cobberty, uh, there was a Foxtel program. We went out and we set this drip rifle up and we actually fired the drip rifle off. Mm. Um, the, the device, I've actually got a photo of it. Uh, I'll come back to this one. That's what we did at Cobbity here. That's the same, my same tin can that we have here. Um, as you can see, with artistic license being what it is, TV being what it is, the bolt still intact, the long range volley sights are still intact, everything is still there. Why am I mentioning that now? Because history, uh, is that previous there? History sometimes throws something at us which we hadn't seen before. Remember, one of my first comments was, Gallipoli has been done to death, and we all agree, yeah? Every man in this dog has written about Gallipoli. This letter is a letter written by William Scurry to his mother from Egypt in January of 1915. And just bear with me while I find the page. So this is his actual letter. Serapium, Egypt, 1915. Sorry, correction, 1916. My dear mother, I am sending with this letter the magazine from my rifle, which I left on the parapet at Anzac. It was a good rifle, but I had rigged it for an experiment, so I did not take it down. The rest left there were old rifles, well smashed about, the sights and nose caps uh, removed, as were the magazines taken out, so they could be of no use to the enemy. I'd like you to keep it, just as a curio, to remind me of things when I get home. So in other words, he has sent this home to his mother. Hands up if you're an eBayer. <laughs> no one knows what's happened to the magazine that William Scurry sent out to his mum. That would have to be a $700 magazine, yeah? yeah Put that one on money. film there, Shane. That's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, folks, again, Glibly has been done to death. But when, when something like that props up, and this, again, it's a letter written by his mum, it's still in possession of his family, I think that's a gem. Because again, it specifically states what condition the rifles were in that were left behind for these devices. Has anyone ever seen that before? No. no. I had never seen it either, prior to doing the comedy show. When, it, when you see it reproduced in, in movies and documentaries and that sort of thing, they often have like, they, they, still, they just put up the full rifle, you know, still with the magazines, Absolutely. still with the sights and so forth. But what he says there makes sense. They don't want to leave anything for the enemy yes. to get their hands on. And as I said, um, I, I tried to convince, don't put this on YouTube by the way, I tried to convince the, the producers to allow me to pull that rifle to bits and, and do it as you see here. I mean, it was an old crappy, rusty, dirty yeah, rifle. Yeah. And they said, no, 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 it doesn't look very nice. So of course, <laughs> yeah. as long as it looks good on camera, that's the main thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And again, that, those two black and white photos, uh, which I showed before again, show the rifles all complete with magazines, yeah. sights. Yeah. Again, I don't know if you're familiar, long range volley sights was like a little flip sight. Yeah. It was a that's dial on the left hand yeah, side. Yeah, the old days of the British standing there in big full lines and, and having volley fire and all that sort of stuff. Well, um, yeah, those, by 1916, those, those items were removed anyway. But having said that, folks, um, yeah, to me, that letter is an absolute gem. It has not appeared in any books no. at all. So if you're writing a book right now on Gallipoli, come and see me. Yeah. <laughs> Was that at the AWM, Gary, or? How did you hold it there? How did you no, trace well, that? My, it actually um, came from the film producers who got it through the family. 
So I haven't seen it as part of the AWM collection. Okay. So I'm not sure. So it's still in private hands, probably. I believe so. Yeah. yeah, to be honest, totally honest, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but. Don't spoil the story, though. I won't spoil the story, no. <coughs> Same movie. Water bottles, water bottles, bottles. Yeah, I guess it's yes. Okay, so as you know, um, the drip rifle works because we've got water dripping from one can to the other. Mm. The fact of the matter is, water on Gallipoli was extremely scarce. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Amongst the first waves to land on the 25th of April were engineers who straight away started sinking um, bores in an attempt to find water. Of course, they didn't realise they were going to be there for nine or sorry, eight months, but nonetheless, um, to find water and water supply was extremely difficult on Gallipoli. So, so one of the greatest problems William Scurry faced was how can he test his device without water? Because the one quart, and I'll just go to a prop which I prepared earlier, what we have here is one imperial quart, 1.1 litres of water. And in that water you would drink, bathe, shave, and if you had some left over, what else would you do with any water? I'm not sure. But having said that, uh, one bottle per man per day. So again, how could Scurry afford to use water? Okay, so this here is a Mark VI water bottle. Um, I've just got a couple of water cut. Yeah, just leave it there, it'll be fine. Uh, if we put that there, we'll scare people off from joining. But <laughs> so again, uh, Bunty Lawrence, Alfred Lawrence is the chap to his left. I'll talk about him very shortly. Again, to the right is a Mark VI water bottle, or what one should look like. So that's this bottle here, without all its coverings. Yeah. What I have here is a water bottle. I'll just talk briefly about this one. Uh, it's recovered from Courtney's Post here. But this one here, seeing we're on the subject of water, is the one I want to talk about. Can anyone tell me what's particular about this bottle? It's salt water. Had salt water? No, that's not what I'm looking for, but it could have done. Yeah, it's you know. a bit of shrapnel through it. It's been turned into a fry pan. Oh, yes, of course. See that there? Mm. I'm going to pass this around. I ask you to be very, very gentle with it. Yeah? So again, it's a water bottle being cut in half, handle shoved in a spout, it's been turned to a fry pan. This was recovered near 4th Battalion Cemetery, which is below McLaurin's Hill. Uh, if you think of Lone Pine, come towards the ocean down in that area there. So just pass that around. Now again, uh, I'm not into hardware for the sake of being into hardware, guns, bullets, all that sort of stuff. I'm into the human side of things. Now some man has cut that and used it to cook whatever, bully beef and biscuits, you name it, whatever he had, uh, stews, or if he if he could, uh, he's made some, and he's used that. And of course, you can see it's got a couple of um, couple of bit of hail damage there, a couple of holes, and as a result of that, he's obviously discarded. But nonetheless, that there, if you look on the reverse, you can see it's been burnt. So just flip right over there. It's been burnt on a fire to cook as a fire So having said that, Bunty Lawrence, Bunty Lawrence, uh, and, and um, uh, William Scurry wanted to make it quite clear. Bunty was his right-hand man, it was his wingman. Uh, it was Bunty who sacrificed his drinking water so that William Scurry could test his own device. Doesn't sound like much now. But you put yourself in that situation and to go 24 hours without water. Uh, and they say he drew a double ration as well. So he actually used one and, and handed one over. On the proviso, he doesn't then claim one the following day. So Bunty Lawrence, Alfred Lawrence, 18 years of age. Now he lands on Gallipoli, round about the seventh, <laughs> 7th of December, 1915. William Scurry had only landed there the week before. Both of these men had, were on Gallipoli for a month or less. Did you know that? I didn't, yeah. Having said that, how did they come up with this invention? It is claimed, it is alleged, that both of these boys, and I call them boys, uh, he was a, he was a apprentice builder, by the way, uh, and, and as I said, William Scurry was a, um, was a uh, architect modeler, so of course they, they, they sort of uh, were handy with their hands. Um, they both had a fascination with the execution of Ned Kelly. Yeah? So the train of thought was, if you get a weight and tie it to something and suddenly release 
platform it's standing on and it drops, what happens? Yeah, poor Ned. Yeah, Ned Kelly is a famous bush ranger. He was hung. Yeah. <laughs> so having said that, um, they say based on that principle, they came up with the idea again of the water dripping, the bottom can filling up, pulling a rock off the butt, and the weight of the rock and combined weight with the, the bottom tin of water, pulling the trigger, bang off goes the rifle. Yeah. Uh, that's nothing written in hard fact. But that is family folklore, and it rings true. I think. Poor Ned. Poor Ned, exactly right. <laughs> Hard done by, <laughs> by the Victorian policeman. Absolutely. So that's my water bottle there that you're passing around now. Uh, that is a piece of equipment I'll talk about very shortly. I'll just finish up with, with uh, Lawrence, uh, Bucky Lawrence and, and, um, and Scurry. Again, I'm conscious of the time myself, so thank you. <laughs> um, having said that, um, so, so these both boys are both 7th Battalion. 7th Battalion being Victorian Battalions. Um, they are in the 7th Battalion as part of the 15th Brigade. Does that ring a bell to anyone? If I was to say... 7th Battalion, 2nd Brigade. 7th Battalion? 2nd Brigade. Oh, sorry, my part, my, hang on. They're, they're 15th Brigade at Fromel. Oh, um, they, their commander is, his, his name has just alluded Elliot. me. Sorry? Elliot. Yes, Tommy, Pompey, Pompey, Pompey Elliot. Elliot. Pompey Elliot. Pompey Elliot. Pompey Elliot. Pompey. 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 Harold Elliot. Yeah. Um, he was their commander. On Gallipoli, uh, Pompey Elliott, as you may know, uh, commands at Gallipoli, goes on to command 15th Brigade at Fromel. That's another story in itself. But uh, oh, yes. nonetheless, he promote well, didn't promote, but he, he channeled um, William Scurry, his career path. William got promoted up through to a lieutenant, and uh, Pompey Elliott put him in charge of their 15th Light Mortar Battery of, of the 15th Brigade, and, and that's how he possibly saved him from being killed at Fromel. Many junior officers lost in that particular battle, uh, 19th of July, 1916. That's, again, another whole story. Uh, having said that, William Scurry, um, with his inventive mind, gets used for all different tasks. At one stage, he is inspecting a German fuse to a bomb of some sort, and it discharged and put shrapnel into his eye, or above his eye, into his head, uh, and the shrapnel then sent him blind in that eye. And then uh, by, the, by war's end, they said the shrapnel moved and it affected his, the side of his other eye as well. So by, by the end of the war, uh, he is slightly incapacitated. Thank you very much. And they say he had difficulty in providing for his family. So unlike Scurry, uh, sorry, unlike um, Beach, who was rewarded financially for his device, there was no reward for him. And there's nothing in his service record either to reflect the fact that he did invent this drip rifle, uh, having said that. So yeah, so William Scurry survives the war, but again, blind or partially blind as a result of uh, wounds received in the wall. Uh, I've just put this up here because it's an, again one of my favourite pieces, recovered in the vicinity of Australia Valley which is in between Hill 60 to the north and Anzac to the south. But you might notice that it's a, it's a buckle from 08 pattern infantry webbing, um, two inch buckle uh, for two inch webbing. But, but what of note there was when I saw this, that is still cotton there. As soon as I touch it, disappeared. Yeah, but that is remnants cotton. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because Gallipoli is one of those few battlefields which is still relatively dry, so things have survived reasonably well. Um, again, I don't know whether you guys picked any bits and pieces up when you went along, but nonetheless, <laughs> this is personal equipment. Yeah, OA patent infantry equipment, um, British design and manufacture, used by Australians during the Gallipoli campaign. Yeah, I just found that remarkable that that cotton webbing would have survived until some idiot named Trainer came along and. And it. <laughs> okay, I'm just about to wind up, folks, and go to question time if you have any questions. Again, I'm not too sure whether I've portrayed the human side of things uh, to you as I've, as, I've, as I've wished, but nonetheless, um, uh, I, I want people to realise, and, and this is more directed at the younger generation. You guys have all been around and, and, and you've been there and done that, but the younger generation see video games now where they play, things are getting killed and shot up all the time. Um, films perhaps don't show the true reality of war. It wasn't until Saving Private Ryan that we saw the war for what it really was. Mm. Uh, I do commend that film. I don't know how you all feel personally about it, but when you compare um, John Wayne getting shot on the sands of Iwo Jima and going to sleep nice and clean, uh, and then the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan, that, that's the reality of war, which is why I like to incorporate those videos um, to show the kids, yeah, it's not a video game. Yeah, for every man who was lost, there's a family back home uh, who is going to grieve that person uh, for the rest of their lives. But I'm going to finish with this photo here, or one of a couple of photos. This is perhaps my most favourite photo in Australian military history. Or one other, I tell a lie. 
um, but that's for a second world war presentation. This is my favorite first world war photo. Has anyone seen this before? No? Is this the guy that uh, collected? No, 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 that, that's I've a good I've got photo a great too. one with that. I'll come, your very similar. I'll come to your lecture when you give on that one. Yeah, yeah, the collector, yeah, indeed. Now this guy here is Alan Stotham Huthwaite. He was from the 1st Light Horse Regiment, a native of Goulburn in New South Wales. Um, Alan Stotham Huthwaite claimed to be under the age of 48. That's what he claimed to be. Um, but you can see here this photo, um, he's standing here, number one outpost is in the, in the background. So number one outpost is just slightly north of uh, Anzac. I guess if you look at where North Beach is, you know where they hold the commemoration now? Just slightly north of that, from the Four Fishermen's Hut. Now you're taking notes, mate. You're going to give me a score at the end of this, are you? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is your assignment one. I, I shut up. <laughs> mate. I shut Remember up. that? <laughs> assignment <laughs> yeah. one. Oh, assignment one, indeed. Um, so having said that, Alan Stogham Huthwaite, uh, light horseman, first light horse, again, at Gallipoli, survives the Gallipoli campaign, goes on to, um, to serve with the Camel Corps and in the Middle East and everything such as that. Unfortunately, he was killed in 1917. But that's not why I'm showing the photo. You'll notice there he has something in his mouth. Now, um, geez, going back 10, 15 years ago now, and that's a scene, by the way, um, from that same film that you've seen. So if you go back to Malaysia, um, Gallipoli, Google it, it's a really good film, yeah? Um, two very, very handsome young men, yeah, Mel Gibson and Mark Lee. Um, oh, probably about 15 years ago, I was approached by um, the mob who were doing the film adaption of Bryce Courtney's book, Jessica. You know the book? Yeah, love story. Um, and they said, we want 40 light horse reenactors. I was doing reenacting back in those days. I was a bit lighter and the horse could carry my weight. Uh, I need a draft horse now. Having said that, uh, she said, I want 40 light horsemen to be in this scene. So we gave her a price for 40 light horsemen. And she goes, well, that's a bit much. Can we have 20? So we amended the price and went back to her. And we can't quite afford 20. Can we have 10? But they all have to look like this. They all have to look like Mel Gibson or Mark Lee. And I said, okay, my next response by email was this photo back to her. This is Alan Sogum, Huffway First Light Horse Regiment. He doesn't quite look like Mark, Gibson, <laughs> Mark Lee. Uh, because this lady, wanted all the boys to be 18, 19. I said, well, they're all gonna be 18, 19 for a start. They're all underaged, yeah? And or secondly, not all, a real Australian man, just for you ladies for, for, uh, from overseas, a real Australian man's got four chins and he's balding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a real deal looks like. Uh, was, was that, that true? Was that the That's horse's absolutely. head or the hell horse's <laughs> tail? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pulling the other one too, so I'm not too sure. Yeah. So hang on, how said that? What's in his mouth? It's a pipe. So do we have any guesses now as to what this may be? Our mystery object. What's his pipe? Pipe cleaning everything. Well done. What is it? Yes. Go for it. But it's for cleaning out the, the, the pipe, getting out, getting all the embers and stuff. And okay, so we have a rounded object here, the round portion for cleaning the bowl of a pipe. Well done. We have a hinge section with a cutter because in those days tobacco, or pipe tobacco, was in a tin, in a roll. That's right, yeah. Rolled up in a tin, yeah. like a rope, yeah? yeah. And, and also in the that. plug. Sorry? They'll have a lot of plugs. Okay, yeah, yeah I'm not too sure. Sorry, yeah, my grandfather yeah, used, used to smoke one. Yeah. And of course, I, I would assume there was timber handles on this edge here. So yeah, so what this is, is a pipe cleaner tobacco cutter. Now again, going back to the personal side of things, like, who's a smoker? I'm not, thank God. And yeah, we're all reformed yeah. smokers, well done, good yeah. job. Uh, so having said that, <laughs> This is a personal item. You can imagine a pipe smoker would be on the rowboat, heading out to the Ascanius or the Orvieto or whatever boats come to pick him up from Gallipoli in December of 19, saying, where the hell is that pipe cutter? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's back uh, on Anzac Cove. Yeah? Oh God. So that's what it is. Yeah, pipe cutter, well done, good job. Yeah. Did you know what it was beforehand? No, I didn't actually. Shall I mention the pipe? Yeah. yeah. So having said that, folks, oh, look, I'm not saying I'm anything special, but I'm just so fortunate that with my background, first of all, as a policeman uh, in conducting investigations of crime scenes and stuff. Secondly, as a curator, um, very fortunate to get a job on my dream job at the Australian War Memorial. Uh, I've just been gifted with the opportunities to, to be able to go to a battlefield and see an object and say, this is what this is. Um, if I can go off on a complete another tangent, uh, if I just hold my shoe up, can you see this here? See the heel on my shoe? I was on Kokoda a couple of trips ago and there was a heel plate. Many Australian boots had the steel metal heel plate. And I walked past 
I don't want to embarrass a tool leader, but I walked past the tool leader and a trekker looking at this little steel heel plate saying, my God, the horses were small here. <laughs> <laughs> the Japanese horses here, there was a heel plate of an Australian boot. So it's just, it's just having that fortunate ability to look at an item and, and know exactly straight away that you know, this, well, where is it, is a clip from a slouch hat. You know, maybe because I've done it up a million times being an ex-reservist yes, so as the boss is here, you know what I mean? And having that sort of exposure to things. So folks, look, I've kind of just touched on things. I mean, there's items here, um, again, a, a round mess tin from a light horse mess tin, a, a mounted, I should say, a mounted mess tin, not a light horse mess tin. Um, bullets, bits and pieces. Here's a bullet that's had a, um, a Turkish round go through it and it's been shattered. So again, please feel free to come up, have a bit of a, a quick look around. Um, it's just bits of rum jar and, and other bits and pieces which I've brought along. Um, folks, I, again, I've sort of gone off on tangents, but thank you so much. For, you've been really, really good audience. Oh, it's very candid. Uh, of the rubble that's brought up, and, and the, the guy that uh, owns McQuet Farm is a good mate of mine, okay. and um, he's always got a pile. And uh, the last time I had uh, RMC cadets, I think their baggage of uh, memorabilia outweighed their baggage. Um, <laughs> and we had full on rifles, the whole thing. Wow. And I just said, holy shit, how are we ever going to get this home through the system? So a very quick phone call to the ambassador down in Paris, somehow or other allowed us when we got off in Sydney um, to just be ushered to one side. Right, wow. but, um, this English gentleman uh, with a group of what they call punters you know, in other yep. words, yep. battlefield weekend warriors over for, to have a look at the Western Front, went straight over to a pile of stick grenades, oh. uh, rather uh, weeping and in bad repair, picked one up and I just said, it's the dick! <laughs> <laughs> and I gave him a bit of a bollocking as only a good old warrant officer can do Absolutely. so. But mate, next time you go walking on the battlefields, leave some. Absolutely. Not everything. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I feel like